My name is Jessie Ace. I'm part of a group of enabled warriors that you've probably never heard of. We're fighting back against our invisible illness and taking the dis out of disability. We don't give sympathy to our symptoms. They enable us to be the warrior that we are. If you asked doctors and nurses, they'd say what we're doing is impossible. But pushing the limits of our conditions is something that we have to break through every single day. So we push the limits. We are mentally strong. And we can do anything. The question is, how far can we push those limits? This podcast will give you the answers. I'm Jessie Ace, and this is the Disabled to Enable podcast. Hey Warriors, unfortunately in this episode the sound is a little bit weird on my part, I don't quite know why. So I have re-recorded some of the questions for you. I really wanted to make sure that you could listen to Kadina's interview because she talks about so many amazing things and there's so much in there that I think can help so many people. So please excuse the bad audio in this episode and enjoy! Enabled Warriors on our show today is an enabled Paralympic warrior. She tried out sprinting competitively when she was just 15 years old and got many podium finishes. She also got into cycling competitively and has now become world champion in two different sports. On the 18th of May 2014, she entered the Loughborough International Athletics and two days later she was rushed to hospital after showing some odd symptoms including all over body burning and ataxic gait as well as dystonia. After two months of physiotherapy, she recovered back to normal and began training again. After extensive tests, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. She entered her first Paralympics in 2015, and within the last four years, she's broken countless world records and received more medals than she knows what to do with. Alongside athletics, she's also been on Mastermind, Celebrity Bake Off, Robot Wars, The Farm, and The Jump. Enabled Warriors, please help me in welcoming the fabulous Kadena Cox MBE, everybody! Woo! Kadena, I can't wait to spend some time getting to know you more today. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey! How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. That was a, an interesting intro. <laughs> <laughs> all that stuff about myself all in one go. Oh, gosh. You are amazing, and I'm so grateful to, to have you here and spend some time with you today. It's ah, thank you. Grand to uh, yeah, be part of your show. So let's get started by talking about what life was like for you before your diagnosis and kind of before, like even getting started in, in athletic and things, because you was really young, weren't you? Yeah, no, so I've, I've always been quite a sporty person. Um, I was um, a dancer from the age of four. Oh. Um, I actually walked at like seven months, never crawled. I just kind of got up straight away and walked. Um, and then I, I did all sports kind of through like school. Um, I played hockey um, and did athletics to quite a high level. Um, and then kind of in my late teens, I decided to focus just on athletics because um, I had a few bony injuries playing hockey. Hockey can get quite vicious, <laughs> um, so I opted to stay with just the athletics. Um, well, alongside doing my um, my degrees, um, and then yeah, I was uh, part way through my fifth. Say part way. I think I was nine months into my physio degree when I um, got ill the first time. Oh gosh! So what happened the first time? <laughs> yeah, so I had the I had the stroke initially, obviously, which was in the May of uh, two thousand and fourteen, and then. Um, thought I was fine and then yeah in the September that was when I became an MS warrior yeah. <laughs> you joined the MS family yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a nice family to be a part of I've got to say <laughs> so, no, the I, connection between us all but yeah yeah no, I, I, I wouldn't change it so it is what it is we're all cool That's people fun. Yeah, exactly. So did you always dream of being in the Olympics one day? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I've, I've done athletics at quite a high level for quite a while. Um, I was aiming to uh, change to the 400 metres the year I got ill, actually. So I was planning to do the 400 metres. Um, and I had a better chance. Everyone's always said to me, Kadina, you will make a good 400 metre runner. 100 and 200, like I was okay at them. But like, if I wanted yeah. to be international, I needed to go to the four. Um, so I tried it, and then I had the stroke, so I thought that was a sign that it wasn't for me. Um, no. Lo and behold, I've come full circle, and four years later, I'm a 400-meter athlete. 
<laughs> oh wow, four years later you're crushing it, <laughs> I've got to say. <laughs> trying, trying. That's awesome. So could you go into a little more detail about what actually happened at the Love for Athletics um, and how you felt about it at the time? Um, do you know what? It was the weirdest thing because um, being a, a physiotherapy student, I, we, we were studying stroke at the time. Oh, no. um, <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, you know, sometimes when you're doing something, you think, oh, I'm just overthinking it because like, this is what I'm studying. Yeah. Um, but I drove down. I hadn't been feeling great kind of the days previous. And I drove down to Loughborough, which is like a two, two and a bit hour drive from mine. And I got out of the car and my, my leg was just dead. Like my right leg just mm -hmm. felt like dead. And I was a bit like, what's going on here? Like my leg feels like super dead. Um, and I've been struggling a little bit with my speech. Um, so I was like, something doesn't feel right here. Um, so I saw a physio and they were like, oh, maybe she's coming from your back. Your back's tight. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, so wiggled my back a bit and kind of thought, oh, well, okay, we'll try it. And then I went to race and I just couldn't get my right leg to like move. Like it just wouldn't do what I wanted it to do. Oh, um, so I was a bit like, mm, okay. Um, had another race. I thought, let me see the physio again. We'll try again. Mm -hmm. Nope, same thing. I was like, I just don't know what's going on. I just can't execute my race as planned. Um, so I drove back home. I spent probably 90% of the time I spent on the cat side, <laughs> bumping along. I had the worst headache, but I thought, I'm just dehydrated. It's been a long day of racing. Like, I'm super dehydrated. I was like, I'll be fine. Um, we went out for food, had a cheeky Nando's. Um, and then I just thought, oh, I'll go to bed and I'll be fine. Um, got up the next day and kind of, I just wasn't in a great place at all. I was like, I don't know what's going on. But we had a ball that night. So I was like, I'm going to keep going. I could barely speak. Like my speech was slurred beyond comprehension. Um, wow. I'd lost use of my hand particularly well as well as my leg. Um, I got ready to go out and I burnt myself with the curlers. I cut myself on shaving. I oh fell down God. the stairs, but I still picked myself up and managed to get out. Oh, <laughs> Safe to say, the following morning, I was taken to hospital <laughs> and told I had a stroke. So, yeah, that was an interesting kind of 48 hours. Um, but, yeah, it was, um, yeah. I look back now and I just laugh. Um, yeah. Because it just kind of yeah. outlines the fact that I am just me and I am stubborn and I was never going to kind of not go to my ball but um. you do though don't you i mean like that's what they initially thought that i had they, they thought that i had a stroke and it was it kind of felt like it was completely out of the blue and i kind of went oh we'll be all right because the strokes already happened so i don't need to stress about it more do i so it'll be fine <laughs> and they were all like have you not just heard what i said and i'm like yeah yeah it'll be fine all right <laughs> and it does. you're just kind of like well you know just i don't know you just kind of go on don't you <laughs> It's weird. All over the punches. Yeah. Oh, it, it's a strange thing. <laughs> so, it can is. Tell us, so can you tell us what it's like to be in your body day to day? Like how does your MS affect you? Do you take any medication, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um. Yeah. So I'm on a lot more medication than I would like. <laughs> Aren't we all? Um, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um. So I'm on a disease modifying treatment and then I'm on um, kind of a couple of medications for muscle spasms um, and a couple of medications for sensation. Um, so my main issues are, I just, so I had, um, and the, the, the relapse that I got diagnosed off was spinal. So I had really bad kind of burning and tingling throughout all my limbs, um, which just hasn't gone away, you know, because it thought it'd be nice and stick around. Um, so without the medication, that's still there. It's dampened with the medication, but it's still I can still feel it. But I missed a couple of days, and yeah, I'm a, in a pickle. Um, and then I have I get really bad muscle spasms. Um, so I, I t it tends to be worse down the right side, uh, which was the side that was affected by the stroke or my first like um, relapse. Um, and then yes, yeah, so I get really bad muscle spasms through that side, but then I get kind of spasms on both sides um when i'm fatigued um i have bladder issues um which everyone loves an annoying bladder my bladder annoys me it's not my friend um <laughs> what other issues do i have i i hope people always ask me that i feel like i've gotten to the point where it's just so normal that i don't even see them as issues anymore totally. like when i when i was very first diagnosed i could reel off everything that was wrong like i'd be like this this and this and the list would go on and now it's just become like 
just it's just a part of my life that I don't even like yeah. think oh that's a problem it's just something I just no. deal with every day that just, yeah it's just, it is what it is until someone says oh my god then I'm like oh yeah that oh, is the yeah. problem oh yeah <laughs> that's not normal <laughs> <laughs> I do that all the time. You know, when you're in the, the neurologist's office or whatever and he's asking you about symptoms, I just forget all my symptoms because they're just normal to me. <laughs> so I actually have yeah. a brainstorm before I go in and write a list down of like, right, what is normal, what is not normal. <laughs> just remind Yeah, that's people. it. It's weird. I saw a new, a new neurologist the other day and, and she was like, oh, so what are your symptoms? And I was just like, oh, no. He did give me a warning <laughs> for this. I was like, <laughs> I'd be like, I'd like to tell her something. I told her like a, a few that I could remember. And then like, I'd be sat there and she'd be talking about something else. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, and this. <laughs> and this. <laughs> just remembering them randomly. <laughs> yeah. the brain just doesn't remember. It is the end of it. I know. I know the feeling. Don't worry. <laughs> so, how did your, so how did your family and friends first react when you told them that you, you had MS? Like, have they, unknowingly, have they unknowingly treated you differently at all? Yes. So uh, in the very beginning, um, me being, I'm such a like stubborn, independent person <laughs> and that kind of disappears in that first kind of phase and everyone wants to do everything for you. Like you go to do something and because you're struggling, someone takes it out of your hands and like yeah. no one wants to give you the opportunity to do. Um, I think my family found it quite hard, um, understandably. Um, I found it even harder that I wasn't able to do stuff for myself when they were trying to take over um but yeah it, it was tricky and I feel like still now like every now and again like when my family like see me like struggling like I think because I I don't know maybe, maybe because I don't struggle that often they didn't I'm like I don't live with my family I haven't lived with my family for a long while um sometimes they do just go into that just like they'll just come and help me straight away and it's more like with my walking which is fine but then there's other times when they just totally forget <laughs> and I'm like guys I'm stuck <laughs> they're like I can't move somebody help me <laughs> which is yes but I mean I kind of I nipped that in the book quite early I was like guys like you need to let me do things myself like yeah. if you keep doing it I'm never gonna learn how to do for myself and I want to be independent I was like you just need to like if you see me struggling that's fine like I'm gonna struggle if I ask you for help then do it but if I didn't ask you for help then don't kind of help mm -hmm um which was kind of something I did quite early on because I I'm not one for people helping me um I think if I'd have let it go on longer my mum would have literally just I mean me and my mum ended up with me and my mum have a great bond anyway but I mean she was literally having to like do everything for me like my mum now knows the very specific way that I like my legs shaving <laughs> so, wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> we, um yeah, there was times I was like, no, this I actually need you to help me with. Um, but I think, yeah, I, my family, I was, I was, what I was kind of like, I need to end this like now, otherwise it's just going to be like months down the line and people are just going to think it's okay to just keep doing for me when yeah. I'm quite an independent person. So I never wanted to be in that situation. Mm. Um, and my friends, like, I think my friends probably struggled a little bit more. Like my close friends, like, so my close friends are like pretty much family. So they're all just like, all, all my close friends are just like, meh, it's Kadena. They're like, they're, they don't fuss over me. Like, they're just like family. Um, but like, because I was at uni, um, I think my uni friends weren't, um, they didn't quite know how to deal with it. And they were more inclined to kind of like run around me and be like, can we do this? And it's, yeah, I, I found that quite hard. Because um, I was on a physio course, I was just like, oh, guys, like, we were doing like neuro, neuro like placements and stuff on neuro like modules. And I'd be like, oh, you can practice on me. And they'd be like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, perfect, like, model. Like, do you not want to try? Well, yeah. <laughs> they, they, I think they all find it quite hard. I'm like, hey, I, I take advantage, but, you know, <laughs> eat to their own. <laughs> I love that. I love how you're just like, oh, yeah, just test everything else that you learn on me. It's great. Yeah. I mean, it, it's easier because you try on each other and no one's got, like, an issue. So it's like, well, how do you know what it feels like to have someone that's actually got, like, some kind of problem? And I'm like, Hey, I've got a tactic gate. Like, try me. I've got weakness. Try me. <laughs> like, you should just play around with it. Like, because exactly. you're never going to be able to. You've got the rare thing where you can actually speak back to them and, and like tell them how you're feeling. Whereas if they, because normally they give you like a dummy or something, don't they, to practice on or whatever. Yeah. Well, if yeah. Not yeah. Really, so. 
Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, I was like, guys, you have literally got prime candidate. I was like, use and abuse. My lecturers were like, you sure, Kadena? I was like, yeah, yep. Yeah. I was like, if I get extra credits for this, go for it. Oh, totally, yeah. Did you? Did you get extra credits? No. <laughs> Well, wasn't worth it. With schools today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no incentive. Don't appreciate going the extra mile. It's ridiculous. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, what do you do to get your mind in the right place to be able to take part in such extensive activity all the time? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it, it's challenging. I think obviously my biggest problem is fatigue. Um, oh, I mean, when I'm doing nothing, I'm fatigued anyway. Um, but then try doing two sports. Um, and kind of double days of training sessions like the fatigue te- levels are just kind of through the roof wow. um that's my biggest challenge and with fatigue comes worse spasms mm-hmm. worse spasms means I can't control the bike like and then you've got kind of risk of injury so it's kind of trying to find that balance um and I've, I've just learned to I nap quite a lot so I've, I've I mean I can fall asleep anywhere like when I was on the jump <laughs> I fell asleep on the snow so yeah like I can fall asleep <laughs> anywhere yeah um, so I've learned to power nap um and it's just just that little bit of recuperation and I think I've just got I got to a point where I was just like I'm going to tell my body what to do rather than letting MS tell my body what to do mm-hmm. um so I'll try everything and I'll try to push myself um and it's normally my coach that says Kadena like did you know pass this time or like go and try something else and it's not very often I let him do that, um, but I think I've gotten to the point where as much as, like, I think when I first got diagnosed, I was just like, push, 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 and I would have just pushed through everything, which I've learned isn't necessarily the right way. Um, <laughs> yet you get the accumulation, and then it's worse, like, further down the line, and I've had problems just because I've pushed myself when I shouldn't have. So it's just like, I've just learned to know when to push, but when to also hold back. Mm-hmm. um and so yeah. sometimes that is someone else saying to me like Kadena, like you're looking more wobbly than normal like let's you know just pull it back or you've come in and you literally are wiped out like there's no point in doing the session mm-hmm. um and as yeah. frustrating as it is and especially because a lot of my um, competitors have cerebral palsy which kind of they have their condition and that's kind of set and most of the time there's not that kind of massive build up of fatigue that you get with MS and you don't get the change in symptoms um so I know they go to a session and nine times out of 10, they'll do the session. Whereas for me, it's more like six or seven times out of 10 that I'll do the session. And mm-hmm. um, so I'm always kind of like, Oh, like it's frustrating. But then I'm like, at the same time, like if I push on and do this, then it's probably going to be more detrimental than it is beneficial. So it's just about, for me, I've just kind of got into my mindset of just making sure everything that I do is quality. And it doesn't matter about the quantity as long as I can get the quality good. Are you able, are you, do you find that you're able to batch your energy at all? Because I know that if I do something, for example, um, one day, then I have to make sure to not do anything the day before or like do minimal things the day after because it just takes it all out of me. Are you able to batch your energy around your training? Yeah. I'd love to bring that in that boat. Um, do you not get that <laughs> I wish it was. I am. Um, ah, mm. I mean, I spend like so. This is the end of so. I have four week training blocks. Um, so I have three hard weeks and then an easy week. Um, so this is today is the end of my third week. So I have been crying out for my easy week like all week. Um, just because my fatigue levels just are like through the roof, and like I wish like so I get a day off. So I have more days off than most athletes. So I have. Uh, a Wednesday and a Sunday off so we try to get a midweek just to try get me fresher and then try to get um, a Sunday but then I've also got um, sponsorship and commercial commitment so I've kind of got to do appearances which tend to be on Wednesdays and then I go to church on a Sunday so I kind of like I start off early in the morning um, and then I kind of get the evening to rest so I'm there's not really a morning where I'm not up early um, and I've always got something to do like my most relaxed days probably my Sundays but then I have to get everything prepped for the week ahead so it's not really that relaxed so mm-hmm. I don't really have time to conserve energy really which is frustrating but I'm always trying to find where I can find a little bit of extra energy and where I can do less so sometimes oh, I used to cycle into training quite a lot um, but because it's just a, that extra bit of energy that I don't need to burn Mm. Uh, and now driving so it's just conserving that little bit of energy um it's just 
yeah, so that that's my way of conserving energy, like not not cycling into kind of training sessions um, and just trying to, I don't know, avoid. I, I'm not that sociable. Like I've had a day out um, today and I've, I've basically just dragged my friend around with me to start what I had to start with just so I could be more sociable. Um, I'm off to find a puppy tomorrow and again, I'm dragging another friend with me to try and be sociable. Um, but this is just because I've not seen any of my friends in so long that I thought, do you know what, I need to squeeze in this weekend mm-hmm. before I go away because yeah. they'll be like, Kadina, we've not seen you in six months. So, <laughs> like, <"Aw>, again. <laughs> that's normally where I avoid kind of wasting energy. It's by being so unsocial. So yeah. I spend a lot of time yeah. in my hall, which is um, my bed. Like I, I think I probably spend like 75% of my time on my bed. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Not a bad place. Not a bad place at all. <laughs> and I've just bought a new teddy to go in there, so it's fabulous. <laughs> oh, nice. That is awesome. <laughs> Did you have to find a new coach who specialised in Paralympic athletes at all when you first started training as a Paralympian rather than an Olympian? Um, so I was actually really lucky. Um, so my coach that I was with at the time um, happened to coach Paralympic athletes before he had me. Um, oh, okay. So he had yeah, so we used to talk about all the time, and we used to joke. So there's one girl who needed a guide runner, so there was times when we'd be like, well, uh, you can be a guide. And we used to have a joke, which sounds really sick now when I say it, but we used to always be like, well, if I just chop off your hand to there, then we could make you a Paralympian. <laughs> Obviously never planning that I'd actually end up being a Paralympian, but we used to joke about it. <laughs> but yeah, so he, he uh, had worked in the Paralympics for years before he had me. Like, he's, he can go probably way back into like the early 90s, like 80s, like to where he'd gone to games. Um, so he was kind of in the Paralympic know-how. So it was just handy that I was with him. Yeah. Um, and then having, he's now, um, he's still back in Leeds and I've moved to Manchester because uh, that's where cycling is based. And within cycling, because it's a centralised programme, they have specific coaches. So I am now with a Paralympic specific coach for cycling. Oh, okay. Um, but my new athletics coach, I'm his first ever Paralympic athlete. Um, it's one of those, like, you don't necessarily need um, a Paralympic coach to, to, unless you're, like, a wheelchair racer or, like, thrower, you don't need a specific, like, Paralympic coach. Like, for me, like, I'm, I'm just a runner and like, my coach just has to work out how to get me from A to B quickest. Um, and, yes, he has to look at the fact that I've got imbalances or whatever, but that's just, it's all kind of just physiological stuff that, Technically, if you're a good coach, you should be able to do so. Well, yeah. He's doing all right for now. He's doing all right. So we'll, we'll give him a pat on the back for now. But we'll, yeah, <laughs> time will oh. tell. It, yeah. Impressive. I can't get over that. that that's really lucky then. That you, you know, he had that background before. I'm really confused about the whole... Um, the, the whole classification system in front of, I no. understand it. I'm, I'm, I'm total like athletic nomad. I've got no idea whatsoever. So <laughs> you are a T38, is that right? But you were a T38 in athletics, yeah. <laughs> Just like, it's what? Confusing. what does that mean? <laughs> so, I mean, it has all changed. So I can't even like, I've got the glasses on now because we need to get serious. This is serious business. <laughs> This is you. This is you really well. If you watch it on YouTube, any would worry. You can check out Kadina's glasses. They're awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, the basically the, the kind of thirty classes within athletics oh. are for neurological conditions. Oh, um, yeah. So your thirty-one to thirty-four are seated. So that's wheelchairs or throwing chair, throwing chairs. Yeah, and then you've got the 35 to 38 which are your ambulance um and within that you've got the 35 that tends to be diaplegic so both legs affected Mm -hmm. um your 36s tend to be all limbs affected um but relatively severely not yeah relatively severely not severely enough that we can't stand but yeah um your 37s hemiplegic so one-sided and then your 38 are basically anyone that doesn't quite fit in there or anyone that does fit into one of the lower categories but is too able to be in one of the lower categories. Oh, um, right. Yeah, it's weird. So technically, if you want to go just based off the um, what's affected, I should be a 36. 
Um, but they were like, yeah, but you're too good to be a 36. <laughs> so I got bumped into the 38s, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay. thanks. Um, so yeah, so obviously, initially, initially yeah. when I was diagnosed, I, I obviously, I, I am a hemi athlete, so I was kind of worst affected down my right side, which was the side that was affected first. Yeah. Um, because when, when I eventually got stronger, um, the right side got stronger, and then they actually realised that the, the stronger the right side got, they realise that there's not that there is then actually some effect on the on the other side, because um, then you can see that both sides are crap. Just w w when the right side was a lot worse, it looked worse, so you didn't really notice the left side. Whereas now that they're slightly more even, then you can see that they're both not great. Um, so yeah, um, but then you look at cycling and you get kind of the C one to five, and their classes make zero sense. <laughs> I have no idea how it's done. I started as a C2, I'm now a C4, and the majority of C4s are missing a leg below the knee, and I have spasms in every bloody limb going, so <laughs> I'm not quite sure how it works. <laughs> I just roll with it now. Like. Yeah, how, do they, how do they actually test it, then? Do you have to go to a certain, I don't know, what it's do we do? The most horrible thing ever. It's, it's not, it's not okay. fun. Um, so it's basically we go to you have to go to a classification competition um, so you go to the, the meeting and you go in, they have to have all your paperwork saying kind of like all your brain scans and whatever, um, it's really easy if you're an amputee because they just basically measure what's missing like, yep <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing there it hasn't grown back yeah pretty much, okay. <laughs> it's alright for them um, but yeah for us so you have to bring all the paperwork in and then they'll do a bench test, which is kind of like, um, you know, like the neurological testing you'll get done, like, uh, when you see neurologists, the kind of, like, strength testing, like, um, coordination testing. Um, it just gets a little bit more intense. So they try and make you do kind of super complex, like, um, coordination tests um, and then, like, balance tests. Um, basically, all the stuff that's going to make, if you've got a neurological condition, all the stuff that's going to fry your brain and make you ten times worse, is what they do. Like it's a horrible situation to be in because they're just making oh, wow. all your symptoms worse, which is annoying. Um, and then they take you outside and they want you to do um, some like technical stuff. So you have to do like jumps and like running and <laughs> stuff that's not really hard because you just made my body like really, yeah. really crap. Um, so they do that bit, and then you have to do a race before they'll give you a classification. So they tend to give you it. So once you've done like all the, the bench testing and the technical testing, they'll give you like a classification they think you are and then they'll confirm that in your race. Oh. Yeah, so yeah, if you're unlucky like me, you end up um having to get that done once a year. Oh gosh. <laughs> I can't believe that. So Deep they lucky. order through these tests and then they go, Now you have to go and have a race. They're like, Really? <laughs> yeah. So you know what so I think I had a day between um the testing and my racing, which oh. I really appreciate. You know, oh. I say a day, it wasn't even a day, it was like 12 hours. I raced the next morning. But you take what you get. <laughs> yeah, just take what you get. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so how's go training going for uh, Tokyo 2020 at the minute? Like, how, how do you manage your training around MS? I know we've kind of discussed it a little bit, but... Yeah, no, it's actually going, it's going really well. Um, we're just learning to manage the fatigue. Like, mm. like I said, the fatigue is what's kind of nailing me right now. Um, I also have really low vitamin D levels, really low magnesium levels, really low iron levels, which doesn't help with, like, the fatigue. I tend to, my neurolog neurologist I worked with um, on one of my um, placements, he was like, you definitely got chronic fatigue. Um, so I end up, end up like, when I'm really fatigued, I end up then getting sick and, like, just having, like, blue light symptoms. Yeah. So we're just trying to, like, avoid that. Um, so we kind of, like, work to kind of avoid that full dip. So we're just trying to kind of work at the right times. Um, mm -hmm. But training's going well. Like, I'm in a great place. Like, um, in both, I'm kind of in really good shape. Um, I've obviously got my Athletics World Championships coming up. Um, and then, I've got a cycling international followed by my world championships um, in early January, late January, at some point. I got to go around in circles. I go around in too many circles. <laughs> but yeah, so it's all going well. Like um, I, I'm in a better position now than what I was in um, pre-Rio. Mm -hmm. um, 
well, firstly, I've been riding a bike for four years as opposed to kind of six months, which kind of helps. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm kind of in a better position now, kind of a year out than what I was right before the game. So I'm definitely in the shape to be able to do um, something special come next year. But I just need to stay in one piece, keep my health well. Like it, it, It's tricky as, as someone with MS, as we all probably fear, that next relapse and how it's going to impact us. Oh, um, I can imagine. It's just it's that dreaded thing, like, when does the next relapse happen? Like, my, my obviously, worst nightmare was, is if it happens at a championship, because there's nothing you can do at that point. Yeah. Um, but then it's like, with the classification stuff, like, if I have a relapse that then makes me, like, kind of worse, in a worse classification, I've then got to try to get classified, and it's just a whole lot of complications. Um, and it's if it's just a relapse that's going to settle, it's how long is that going to last and how long is that going to take me out of training? Mm. Um, so there is that constant worry. Um, and my worry is because I don't like, and I know um, quite a few people that have, you kind of more like, more frequent relapses, but not like as bad. Mm. Whereas for me, I don't get them that often, but when I get them, like, I'm one of those, like, hospitalised, like, you are out for, like, five weeks, like, you are doing nothing. So I worry, like, that, like, more, because I just know, like, when it happens, it's going to happen, like, it's going to be big, which is, like, I haven't had that many relapses, um, but I'm on disease modifying treatment just because my relapses are always so bad. Mm -hmm. um, so they just obviously don't want me to be more and more disabled than I need to be um, at such a young age. Um, so that, that literally is just my worry, just, you know, having a relapse and with that comes trying to reduce the stress but with being an elite athlete the stress kind of creeps up so it's yeah. trying to kind of balance it so it's a fine line between um yeah being a good athlete and um tipping the ms over the edge it's a hard balance i totally feel for you on that one <laughs> i cannot imagine <laughs> so going back to the fatigue and things that, that we were talking about before um, so I saw that you mentioned in a recent interview about your struggles around body dysmorphia and disordered eating and things, which I imagine doesn't help the fatigue that much if you're not getting that nutrition into you. So can we chat a little bit about what that kind of means to you and um, just discuss that a little bit further? Yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, I always say when I, so when I got, when I got diagnosed with the MS, I ended up spending kind of three months housebound um I was at home I was I was literally in bed for like I could only go between my bedroom which was kind of up one floor and down to the bottom of the stairs and mm -hmm. just getting downstairs was like pain so I'd stay upstairs my mum was bringing me meals like through the day um okay. obviously on steroids um I'd gone from kind of doing 10 sessions a week to being bed bound so mm -hmm. within like three months I put on like three stone like which I mean, doesn't surprise me. I was, I'd literally gone to just being so sedentary and then was just eating and my mum cooks great food. <laughs> but it wasn't great at the time. And I think that's probably the hardest thing that I found to deal with, just how much weight I put on. Um, and especially just as a female athlete. Um, and I really struggled with that for, I mean, I still struggle with it now. Um, but I think it was just, I think because the weight gain didn't come as a result of just getting older. I mean, you get older, you get more curvy, don't we? So it's probably going to happen anyway. But I think because it was the MS that kind of just like made me just pile on all the way. Um, I, like I kind of was then that, that, that happening. Mm. Um, I say that, but when I was kind of, what, a stone and a half, 10 kilograms lighter than what I am now, I still thought I was fat. So there was always something in there that I just, I clearly just, uh, I have one of those brains that just doesn't see my body in the way that it actually is. Um, so in terms of, I look in the mirror, doesn't matter what way I am, I still always think I look big. And like, I can't really differentiate like the different sizes. Um, and I just see myself as always being too big. Um, and I don't ever feel like I'm the right shape to be an athlete. Like I look at other athletes and I'm just like, oh my God, look how great they look. And I never see that in myself um and that with obviously the pressures of competing the pressures of wanting to be the best um mm -hmm. pressures of wanting to look the best when you do my sport you don't wear very much so i can either i'm either wearing really really tight lycra or i'm wearing not very much clothing um and you do feel the need to look a certain way um 
competing with some of the girls in athletics, they are, a lot of them have cerebral palsy, which means their metabolism is super high, so they're all tiny. Um, so even at my smallest, I still look massive compared to them. Um, and that does play on my mind. And that people have made comments about my weight before, and it just makes you more paranoid about it. And I think I started out kind of just dieting and trying to lose weight. But then when you've got all the medication and stuff, and um, when you have MS, your metabolism is actually slower for some reason. So a dietitian told me. Um, but all the other stuff, and it's, it's really hard to lose weight. And I think I just was kind of playing around with different diets. I did all, I, I feel like I've done every fad diet, I've done every crash diet. Um, and then I just kind of got to the point where I'd read stuff about different types of fasting um, and how it can be beneficial. So I just wouldn't eat for a few days. Um, and then I get in cycles of then you've not eaten for days and all you crave is sugar. So then I just binge on kind of sweets and chocolate and cake and anything sweet that I could get my hands on. And then I'd feel like crap. Yeah. So I'd then take either a laxative and make myself sick and then wouldn't eat again for another period. And then you just end up in this cycle. And before I realized I was in this cycle, I was in this cycle. Mm. Um, and then you realize you, you actually don't know how to get out of the cycle. Um, and I, I just got to a point where there was a point where I just realized this is actually really dangerous. And as much as I know that to be a better athlete, I need to get out of this cycle. And I know what I'm doing is wrong, but it doesn't mean I can stop myself from doing it. And that's the point at which I'm at now. I find it really hard to be able to kind of overcome the demons in my head. Um, I mean, I find it a lot easier to talk about it now. I used to literally not be able to talk about it without crying. Um, mm. But I'm at a point now where I can talk about it, but I'm still not at the point where I can control the thoughts in my head. So it's a challenging thing. And I think as an athlete, I mean, I've spoke to a lot of people and a lot of, a lot of athletes have messaged me, whether they be female or male, doesn't even matter what sport they come from. And I think it is just a thing that it's not talked about enough. So people feel ashamed to talk about it and they don't, they don't talk about it, which then means they then continue to do things they shouldn't be doing without seeking the right support. Um, and then it just gets worse and worse. Like the longer you do it, it becomes a habit and it's second nature. And how do you then break that? Um, and then you've just got like, a lot of people that don't even realise they're in that situation. Like, yeah. so, so many athletes have, like, there was one athlete in particular, and a fellow athlete, and she said to me that she, once she read my article, she actually took a minute to stop and think, and she was like, do you know what? I actually do that without having realised it. Like, she was like, do you know what? I do that. And I think because we're so, like, we are kind of people that, with athletes, you, you have the type of personality that lends to a lot of disorders um and you, you do get a lot of mental health issues, health issues within athletes but it's because we're kind of programmed to hit that goal to be like the best like to everything has to be like optimal um, and yeah. so we do push the boundaries and kind of go that little bit cray cray <laughs> and it just um yeah it's um it's an interesting thing just because it's not talked about enough. Um, and I feel like the more, if it was talked about, more people wouldn't feel like it had to be hidden. They wouldn't deal with it by themselves, which would make, mean that they wouldn't end up in kind of a worse position. Like I know there's a lot of athletes that have actually retired early because of it. Um, and I, I find when I'm away on holiday, on holiday, for the most part, my last holiday, maybe not so much, but when I'm kind of away and I'm not in season, I can block out kind of my life as an athlete, my life back home, and if I step away from that life, um, and I don't have my scales, and I'm not constantly looking in the mirror, I can eat relatively normally, mm -hmm. but as soon as I get back home, as soon as I get within, like, inches of the scale, like, I'm, I'm just back to being that person that's controlled by the numbers, that's controlled by kind of a feeling, like, yeah, it, and it's, it's, it's a challenging place to be. And if you don't have the right support, it's really hard to deal with. I've got the right support and I still mm. struggle with it. Um, but it's making it easier. And I think it's, it's always about taking steps forward. There's a lot of steps back, which I'm actually bored of now. Like, I just want to be better already. But I think it's just one of those things that you've got to deal with. Um, but yeah, that's in a nutshell where I'm at with that. that that's incredible. And it, it's, it's amazing that you, you are speaking about that and you are getting it out there. Because it is, like you say, it is such an important thing to highlight because I had no idea that, that that was even going on with athletes behind the scenes because you just you don't know do you 
you literally don't know until people talk about it so it's just no it's amazing so thank you so much for <laughs> highlighting that and bringing that to everybody's attention definitely yeah no, yeah yes yeah, yeah. yeah everyone, everyone just sees us as amazing athletes and don't realize that it takes a lot to get yeah. onto the podium and people miss the kind of the challenges of getting there it's amazing because there's so much media pressure as well isn't there i was reading um the, uh, was it Jessica Ennis Hill who had like a, a really horrible person from the media say that she was fat or something I was just like yeah. why? why would you even say that to someone it's just yeah it's, 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 it's quite often which is so bad <laughs> it's annoying but <laughs> like, just that little bit of extra weight and someone comments on it and then yeah. you just feel like because you feel like you have to be a type of a certain type of way but there isn't there isn't I know that there isn't one type that makes you a good athlete. Like there are athletes that are all different types and types, which are amazing in their field. Um, I tell me I know that, but telling myself that I don't need to be the way I think I need to be is, is also challenging. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is hard though. It is hard, and it's it is a subject that I would love to go into more detail and like discuss with you because it's just I re I find it really interesting. Um, and so you, you've got a good network around you now. So you've got like a, a psychotherapist, was it a sports psychologist, nutritionist, dietitian? Like how, how have you found that they've helped you? Are they giving you kind of um, things put in place all the time to kind of catch yourself when you're thinking these things? Or Yeah, no, it's, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's been really helpful. Um, so I've got um, a psychiatric doctor who is fabulous. Um, I can literally talk to him about anything and he's not bothered about my eating. He's more bothered about my mental state. Um, yeah. So that's what he, he kind of takes control of trying to work out where my head's at and hopes that the eating will take control of itself. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got a sports psychologist who kind of just allows me just to talk. Um, and then we focus on how I achieve my sporting goals. Um, I have a performance lifestyle advisor it was literally just an ear that I chew off all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and then my dietitian kind of helped me. I've got a dietitian and nutritionist. Dietitian is more kind of making sure that I'm getting the right um, kind of nutrients in. Like I said, I'm really deficient in quite a lot of things. Um, but I mean, when you're not eating properly, it's kind of normal. Um, but then, yeah, I have a nutritionist who's kind of helped me with kind of the sport inside of it, some more kind of their recovery and make sure I'm getting the right amount of protein in um, and they both kind of work with each other to one's kind of really boosting that kind of sporting like need for nutrition and the other's kind of just making me understand um, what I need kind of just to live day to day but they both give me a better understanding of what I'm doing and how it impacts me um, and kind of what like just the science behind what not eating for a certain amount of time does and kind of how that impacts your weight and how it can be detrimental in the future um and then i do just have a sport doctor who's quite blunt with me sometimes um and she'll just kind of tell me like what can happen if you continue down this kind of the horrible scary things like the heart attacks and kind of all that kind of crazy stuff that can happen um and then she'll just kind of like things like just explaining to me like what laxatives can do to you and how that can impact your your body like long term and just looking at if anything sometimes it's just okay if this is something you're going to do um there are other options like that's kind of one that's worse for you um so it's just kind of they've kind of got to the point where they're not trying to control my eating they're trying to give me the best advice so that i can take control of it myself because yeah. I think with something like this, it, it's never going to be someone's going to tell you to do this and you're going to do it. Like, mm -hmm. it's you need to do it yourself. So I think they're just doing the best to give me the most information so I can try and make the right decision for myself, which mm -hmm. I think is uh, fab. And it just, it, it's helped, like, being able to talk to them has helped me be able to talk to my friends, my family, and just kind of talk to people in general about it more openly. Um, I mean, I've said to you, I'm, I'm an open book, so I'll, I'll talk about kind of anything but it took me a while I probably I probably suffered maybe like three or four years beforehand before even saying anything um but I think just yeah being able to speak about it has kind of feels like it's lifted away and even though it's hard 
when I'm having wobbles or when I'm like in a place that's not great, mm-hmm. it's actually nice to have someone to be able to talk talk it through with and just reason. Yeah. Um, and I think, like everyone's phone's always on the roll, like the roll. Like there's been times when I've had um, meltdowns and literally just sat in a corner of my room and just cried and just cried for hours and just cried myself to sleep um, mm-hmm. and not really kind of knowing what to do just because a number on the scale has just literally made me feel like everything's gone wrong um and they've just all made me like well I feel bad because I like, obviously like I have my sporting team around me but I'm like it's the weekend like I can't bother you but they're all just like no being at our phones always on like it doesn't matter like we are like there to support you guys like 24 7 so if you ever need to just call then just call so it's quite nice to have that like because it's not I sometimes find that it's not always it's not always easy to speak to your family because it, it, there's such an emotional attachment to that yeah um so just kind of having people that you don't have that attachment with is it makes it a little bit easier because I think if I told my family the ins and outs of what I was doing that I mean the first time my mum heard some of the stuff I was doing because she came to my first meeting with my um psych doctor um yeah I, I yeah she was quite worried I, I don't think she'd realized how bad things were um mm-hmm. but yeah I think for them it's quite more they get more emotionally attached so it's easier for me to speak to someone else um so I think but I mean, especially being from a Caribbean family, like the their thing is always like, "Oh, come eat!" Like eating is like a Caribbean thing, so like, so it's like, "Oh, come and eat." But for me, that's like, "Oh, let's not do yeah. that." <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, it's just nice to have a great support network. Gosh. Huh? As if for you, that's probably the worst thing ever having uh, that that kind of family associated like all the ways around food and things. Oh. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I I love it, and I just love like my family coming together around food but yeah. I did get to a point where I was just avoiding going home just because I knew when I go home I'd have to eat yeah. um and if I didn't eat people would pick up on it um I mean now I've had some problems with it being the other around the world I've, I've eaten and people have made comments which then makes me feel like I don't want to eat so yeah <laughs> yeah it swings in roundabouts <laughs> it's, roundabouts. Uh, it's crazy isn't it it really is <laughs> And it's hard to know what to say to people as well sometimes because you've also got that thing where you're kind of like, oh, I don't really want to tell somebody and then kind of go, actually, I don't want to be judged for that and you're going to see me differently. And and yeah. ugh, it's it's really interesting. And I think, um, so, so like, how would you find other, how do you find other Paralympic athletes? Is, is it like a close network where you're all kind of in it together kind of thing or because you're competitors, you're all kind of like separate? <laughs> you know um, I mean. do you know what it depends like so i like some of my best friends are on the team i didn't compete against them actually <laughs> the, ones that, the ones that they don't compete against them i tend to get on with really well um there's a couple who i get on with really really well that are my direct main competitors um one of i mean some of the athletes that i get on with best the kind of yeah people who are literally like my rivals um but then there's other ones that just don't like you. Like I, I'm one of those people. Like I'm just like if you if you perform well, like I'm not going to knock you for it. Whereas you've got some people who can be quite catty um, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. decide they don't like you because you're better than them. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I I'm not bothered. I, I'm I'm just a I'm quite a chilled, happy person. Like I'll talk to anyone. Like I haven't got I'm not one to create an issue for no reason. So mm-hmm. I, I'm just like I'm pretty easy going. Um, but there are there are some athletes. I'd say. I'd say in athletics, there's, there's a lot more kind of like talking behind each other's backs and people not liking each other than there is in cycling. Cycling is a smaller sport. It's a more mature sport, I'd say. Um, so you kind of don't get that. Whereas you've got, yeah, in, in athletics, you, there's, yeah, stuff I can't be bothered with, <laughs> essentially. A lot of politics going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Because... Yeah, it must be it must be tricky because at the end of the day you kind of all it together, but you also at the same time, you know, some people like you say probably would kind of go, yeah, I can't really be friends with you because I'm going to compete with you, and oh, it must be so like tricky to know who to trust as well. I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I just don't get it because I'm 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 one of those people like I'm, I'll I'll be in like another athlete's corner like wishing yeah. them to go well like I I want people to go well. And to be fair, if someone beats me, like, I'm the first one to congratulate them, like, you obviously have to work hard to beat me because I'm working, like, really hard, you know what I mean? Yeah. I just appreciate that we're, we're all grafting together, like, we're all working hard, like, so you've just got, like, if someone beats you or someone's better than you, then that, 
I'm just not an issue. Like, I, I don't, I, I never get this whole rivalry thing. Like, yeah. I'll have rivalries on the track, but as soon as you get off the track, like, even like within like different like, nations, like one of my favorite athletes is um, a Brazilian athlete who she beat me in the hundred in Rio. I beat her in the four hundred in Rio. Like, but we both like <laughs> celebrated together for both of them. It's just one of those things that you just kind of. So there's, there are some athletes that I, and it's normally the older ones of us that kind of just like you just appreciate what we're all doing. Um, but yeah, there are some that just don't quite get that. <laughs> I think you get that with anything, though, to an extent, don't you? It's, there's always some sort of people like that, and just like, oh, whatever, can't be bothered. It's been in the workplace, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny. It is funny. <laughs> so since. Um, since becoming like a Paralympic uh, superstar, if you like. That's what you're um, <laughs> So you've been asked to be on quite a lot of like, um, I don't know what kind of shows you call them. My brain has gone completely to mush right now. Um, like what kind of TV shows? Like kind of like reality TV? Yeah, it's TV. It? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's TV. Okay. I don't have a TV anymore, so I kind of forget like <laughs> what terminology and stuff is. So what was my it TV's like? TV's like my best friend. <laughs> what was it like when you were kind of first asked to be on those kind of programs? Were you just kind of like, whoa, like, why are you asking me? That's crazy. Or was it more of like a, yeah, sign me up? <laughs> um, you know what? Like, a, it's really weird because like, you get asked to do them as a celebrity. And I'm like, I'm not a celebrity. <laughs> I'm just an athlete that happens to be good. Um, <laughs> but like, I think the first time I was just buzzing. Like, I was like, this is super cool. Like. So my first show was the jump, which is obviously awesome. Like, I got taught how to ski. Like, I got to do so many stuff that I wouldn't do in the real world. I've not skied since. I would love to, but it's kind of not within my contract to be allowed to do that. <laughs> well, I was going to yeah, say, well, like, where did your contract stand on that? Because if you, like, broke something, then you'd be out of training for everything else, wouldn't yeah. you? So where would you stand Yes, I, was, I wasn't contracted during that period, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> um, but yeah so um there was the, yeah there's that so I was just excited about doing that then like uh I did Robot Wars which is really fun because I got to do that with my little brother um which oh, was a great opportunity just you know to bond with him and you know do something different that that's kind of a show that I watched in my childhood so that was cool yeah um, I loved I it. I just, yeah like Robot Wars was cool back in the day um but I think I just I just love getting like asked to do like different things like because it's stuff you watch and you just think, oh, I'd love to do that. Like, yeah. break Bake Off, like, that was... Oh, my God, like, Bake Off, seriously. All time. <laughs> I, I absolutely love it. Who doesn't love it? So to be able to do it, I was literally just like, yes. <laughs> um, that was my favourite thing, probably my favourite thing that I've done. Um, but, I, yeah, I've done a couple of shows this year as well, which have all been pretty cool. Um, got a few that I'm still waiting to air, so... Oh, I've had a good time. Like, it, it's, it's quite fun. Like, you meet different people, and it, it's normally the fact that on the shows like you're not just stuck around like athletes like there's loads of people from different backgrounds yeah. um which makes it more exciting because like it's having all these people from different backgrounds and then we've kind of got to spend time together and do stuff together um which yeah it's cool like and it's nice to see like it's nice to be outside of like the athletics world like we kind of live in a bubble so it's nice yeah. to be outside of, like yeah yeah so it's, it's nice to do other things and a break from training i guess as well <laughs> yeah that's well Although, to be fair, while I was on the jump, I was still training because I had worlds the following year. Oh, God. Um, all the following months, yeah. I don't think I've ever not trained on a TV programme. No, I haven't. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. Sad, sad life. <laughs> that's crazy. I'm still so jealous that you're on Bake Off. I mean, I think that's the most awesome thing ever. Um, do, do you get yes. like really competitive when you're on these programs or is it more of like a oh, I'm not really bothered because it's, it's just fun kind of thing <laughs> so, oh I'm just going on it for fun deep down I really want to win <laughs> like I don't, I, don't, I don't think athletes can turn off that competitiveness like no, no matter what you do you just want to win <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah <laughs> so you're quite a, like a natural baker or not natural cake baker um, yeah. I do cakes. Um, okay. Yeah, I do cakes. I mean, my pie on Bake Off didn't go to plan. Um, and I made muffins, which again is kind of cakey, so that was all right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, I'm just a cake baker. I am playing around with um, a couple more pastry stuff um, over the coming months. I'm um, trying to become more 
I'm just trying to have a wider variety of things I can bake. I'm trying, I want to do bread as well. So I'll be doing bread, doing pastries. Okay. I'm doing a couple of like pies and stuff. Um, but yeah, I normally I'm just a bit of a cake baker. I've actually got three cakes to bake this week, which, yeah, oh, wow. I don't know where I'm going to find that. <laughs> you say doing them for family and stuff now. Like, oh, you're, well, you're good because you've been on Bake Off now. You can make me a cake. <laughs> you're like, mm. yes, yeah, what everyone goes with. But because I, I, um, I can't actually, or I don't currently work as a physio, um, I'm um, starting to um, play around with the thought of um, setting up my own cake business and just selling cakes. Um, oh, awesome. Because um, I can fit cakes in around kind of my everyday living, so. Yeah. Yeah, something I might play around with. Oh, that's so cool. Like, totally do that. <laughs> yeah, I like baking cakes. I just need to not eat them. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, because that's quite an interesting thing when you've got kind of disordered eating and things, like how, how do these two kind of marry together? But... Um, do you know what? In the, when I was kind of at my worst, I absolutely loved baking. I think it was, it would just, I don't know, like just having that focus like, and being creative, like just having something to take me away from the thoughts of, I shouldn't be eating this, like, just constantly going around my head, the numbers, like, what numbers on the scales, like, what are we going to eat, how many calories have I eaten, how many grams is in this, then just focusing on being creative and, like, kind of creating a cake that, like, I've not been able to do before, or seeing something and being like, actually, I want to try to replicate that, like, I really enjoyed just kind of getting into that, and then I enjoyed, I just became a feeder, essentially, I just, like, always bake, and it had to be out of my house within 24 hours, it wasn't oh. out of the house in 24 hours, I'd probably have a moment and eat the whole thing, so... I just used to like take them out, but then I enjoyed like people saying how nice it was or how good it was, and I never tried them myself, so I I just kind of relied on other people's kind of opinions <laughs> of them. I could have been a horrendous <laughs> baker. <laughs> yeah, they just all be really, being really nice to you. It's like, mm, yeah, it's really nice to do them. Mm, yeah, great. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, I'm one of seven children, so my um, my brothers and sisters will be very honest with me. Yes, I'm sure they were great. Don't you worry. <laughs> Oh wow! So, so something slightly um, what? How would you say crazy that happened? Is um, you became a member of the Order of the British Empire? Like what? Yeah. And I had no idea that that's what MBE stood for, by the way. And Kadina thought that was really, really funny for everybody watching and listening on the <laughs> podcast. Kadina thought that was really funny, but I actually had no idea what MBE stood for. So right. I didn't know either until I got one. So <laughs> I'll give you that. <laughs> so did you have to go to like Buckingham Palace for that? Did you meet the Queen? Like what was that like? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so you go to Buckingham Palace to get that. I actually so mine was done by Prince William, which was uh -huh. super cool. He's probably like I met him before that and I wasn't sure about him, but then on that day he literally like he was asking me about my two sports. Um uh -huh. he was it asked me about being on the jump, like so they, like they, I think he'd done like eighty ninety people that day. And he maybe had like a two second like moment where the person in his ear like was kind of like, oh, this is this person. But like he was able to have like an in-depth conversation with me. Wow. I was like, also obviously like researched into it, which I thought was super cool. Um, so I, I gained a respect for him. Um, but I, ha I have met the Queen. So I met the Queen. I actually met the Queen when I had a hangover, which is horrendous. That's <laughs> <That's laughs> <funny. I> was... <laughs> I was struggling that day. Oh no! When was this? Um, so we did um, we did parades. We did um, a parade in Manchester um, and then a parade in London after the games. Um, but the parade in Manchester happened first, um, and that night. So I think we went to like the town hall and was drinking prosecco, kind of with all the all the Olympians and Paralympians. Kind of there was prosecco flowing. When there was a club that said, "Oh, any athlete with a medal can get free drinks all night." Oh well, no! <laughs> that didn't go <give> good. <laughs> I think I remember getting in at like half past five and realizing we had to be on a train at quarter to seven. <laughs> and I was like, "She's like, I'm not going to be sober." Oh, so no. then we had to get on this trip train down to London and then a bus through London, oh. um, and then we had to sit on this stage. Everyone just felt rough. Um, <laughs> I had to like pretend to smile because there was all the fans there that had come to see us. And then all the special ones of us got to go and see the Queen. I was like, Ooh. I think of anything worse right now. <laughs> I literally, I was, so, I was so hungover. I didn't think I've ever drunk so much in my life. 
um and then i got yeah so i went to the i went to buckingham palace and um it was like a line of us and everyone's kind of like introducing themselves and um, so i met the queen she didn't have very much to say i met william who had a few words but not very much and then met kate who is very lovely bless her and then i met harry who said want a glass of prosecco kadina oh, <laughs> like, oh. what? <laughs> he was just like i've heard you're hanging and i was literally just like yeah, about that, your majesty. <laughs> I'm not really sure what to say to you right now. He was just like, I can get you a Prosecco if you really want one. I was like, oh my God, this is so awkward. Uh, yeah, it made it, uh, it's something I'll never forget, but I was struggling. Um, oh, wow. I had, yeah, so good moments, good moments. We had a good time. We, it's, it's, it's rare that athletes all get together. It's rare that we can all get together and we're allowed to drink, so... When it does happen, it ends up (laughs) crazy. Yeah, exactly. It was free alcohol. (laughs) Don't ever say that. (laughs) That is brilliant. I love that. Oh, wow. So, (laughs) I mean, how do you follow that? That's amazing. So, how, (laughs) so finally, before we go, what advice would you give to someone who is newly diagnosed, um, trying to get their mind in in a place where they can actually conquer their illness and stuff? Like, what, what would you even say to them? Um, do you know what? I always find this one really interesting because I um I guess I'm I feel like I was quite abnormal in the fact that I got over it in like a day I was just like cool like I started a fundraiser the next day like to get back into athletics I was like wow. just the fundraiser <laughs> and I guess having my sport did keep me driven but I was just like yeah I'm over it <laughs> not quite like that but like yeah I was, I was pretty like okay I was like as long as I can run then I'm fine um but I think what I did struggle with was just kind of um, initially that um, thought that I think I was like, oh, I'm going to do this now because I might not get the opportunity to do it in the future. And it was like, well, MS is going to impact this. MS is going to stop me from doing this. Blah, blah. Like it was always like MS equals no. And I think I then had to kind of reprogram in my head the fact that MS doesn't have to be like a death sentence. Mm-hmm. And I was like, actually, MS can be a positive thing. Like, MS means, one, I'm a Paralympian. Um, two, I've been able to do something I wouldn't have been able to do and I'm, like, British record holder, world record holder, have all these cool things, have an MBE. <laughs> and then I now have an amazing MS family, which I wouldn't have. Like, I've met so many pe- amazing people with MS. I've been able to travel the world. I mean, I, half the time I'm in my wheelchair, I have a constant seat, like... It's good to have a seat sometimes when you're out. Like, you, I feel like I've had so many opportunities that I wouldn't have had. Like, even just, like, random, like, um, conversations that you have that, like, stem into something else just because someone's kind of said, oh, you've got a cool wheelchair. I got a cool wheelchair just so people would talk about my cool wheelchair. <laughs> yeah. It just kind of, like, you just have, like, random conversations. Like, I've, I've, like, I've met, like, people that I can go into business with later in life. Like, I've just had so many opportunities and it's not a case of ms kind of being like that whole whole no it's like well actually how can i use ms to my advantage and what can i do to show ms that i am still in charge like it's, it's just trying not to be controlled by ms and just kind of turning it around on its head and mm-hmm. rather than ms say no just kind of using ms to your benefits like ms yes it sucks i mean would any of us keep it probably not yeah. but there are there are things that it, it, it can be used to to its advantage and yes we might be not be able to do things as we would have done before but it doesn't mean we can't do them we just have to do them in a different way exactly so, exactly yeah. and that to me is the definition of being enabled rather than disabled and that's just there you awesome <laughs> there <you go>. <laughs> <laughs> so, great advice there <laughs> So, okay, Enabled Warriors, we've talked about some heavy stuff today. Let's have some fun before we go. This is the part of the show where we find out a little bit more about the personality of our guests with some super quick secrets. Are you ready for this, Cad? Cad is (laughs) ready-ish. Okay. Don't worry. Everybody says that, and it's always the part where they go, "Uh, yeah. (laughs) I love this run. I think it's great. So what is the most inspiring book that you have ever read? Um, what is it called? So it's a Christian book. Um, 
and it's called it's something woman it's basically a women's empowerment book off the top of my head i can't remember what it is it's just one word that i can't remember um come back to me on that one but it's a fabulous book it's basically um a book about how to be a better version of yourself but like so it's an empowering message from a, a pastor and his daughter who is kind of uses the um, a lot of his examples on it's pretty cool awesome i love that hopefully you remember the title because that sounds really good <laughs> <laughs> okay what is the weirdest thing that you've ever done i love this question so <laughs> do you know what it's something that i've done re recently um i don't think anyone would have ever, ever said this to you um i went on a dinner date with my ex while being filmed right okay <laughs> do you want to explain that one i mean you can't you can't leave that hanging <laughs> The TV show called Eating With My Ex. <laughs> oh, see, I don't have a TV, so I've got no idea what's going on right now. <laughs> yeah, no, so... Um, I love that. That must be so awkward. Surely. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. It's an interesting one. I think it was weird because <laughs> we both moved on, so we're both with other people. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, yeah, it was all right. We're still friends. Well, that's, that's good. That's good. Because if it ended really badly, you'd be like, I really don't want to do that. <laughs> Yeah, and it was, it was a bit of a weird one. He, we basically, so my best friend is his best friend. Um, oh. So it was just awkward. So like, I was just like, we kind of need to just get this out and all that in the open so we can like be around each other rather than it just being awkward for everyone in the room. Oh, <laughs> that's hilarious. I've never heard of that before. That's like, they come up with some really weird ideas for TV programs, don't they? They do. So what is your most favourite place that you have ever visited? Probably the homeland, which is Jamaica. Oh, nice. I would love to go there. <laughs> yeah, my family is Jamaican. Um, fingers crossed my future husband will be Jamaican. If Ooh. he can get his eyes. Um, yeah, sorry. I, sorry I, met, I met the guy that I'm da dating over there. Um, but yeah, my family is Jamaican, so I go back there all the time. Um, I just find it really peaceful. It's like it's kind of the place that I've escaped to quite a lot, um, mm -hmm. especially when my head's been in a bad place. So it's kind of my my happy place, and it's beautiful. I would recommend everyone goes. It's so nice. <laughs> noted, definitely noted. <laughs> what would you say is the scariest thing that you've ever done? See, so, yeah, this could be could be two things. It could be either be throwing myself down from the top of a ski slope and jumping off. Wait, oh, anyone would think it's scary like who ski jumps like why would you do that I don't know because there's a TV show that's like Derek you know yeah a bit crazy or <coughs> asking my um, performance directors if I could do two sports um, at the Paralympics because it never it, like it wasn't allowed to be done um, oh. and I thought I was going to get shot down um, I didn't think I would get away with it I, I thought it was going to be a no so I went into it thinking it was going to be a no but um I obviously really wanted it to be a year and um, got away with it. Got away with it for now, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So where can other warriors find out more about you and what you do? And I will include all of these links into the show notes as well. Um, best place, hashtag Insta. Everyone loves Insta. Um, I've actually been off Insta for a little while. Uh, I mean, I've been kind of, I think I popped on the other day when my car went missing. Um, but yeah, I've been off Insta for a little while. But I'll be back. I'll be back. I just needed a little break, a little refresh of the brain um, to find the right set. Um, I'm on Facey B. I don't use Facebook that much, actually. I said Facey B. That, that's how old you know it is. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, so I do, I do probably tweet more than I post on Facebook. And I have a blog where I do uh, my um, I'm currently doing a 12 months of Tokyo blog uh, which talks all things MS and eating disorders and any other rubbish I feel like talking um, and I do have a YouTube channel but don't look at my YouTube channel because there's really really old videos of when I was first diagnosed with MS when I think I was just super weird um, I can't watch them without cringing but I will be bringing back some uh, some new videos. I've got a few blogs that I need to upload, um, which should be pretty cool. So, yeah, when that's the new stuff comes out, awesome. then you can watch YouTube. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. What's your blog called? Um, 
so it just clean cox dot com <laughs> and it's called um twelve months of Tokyo with MS and disordered eating. Nice. So go and check that out, NA Warriors. And thank you so so much for coming here today. It's just it's been so great to speak to you and to spend some time with you. And remember, Warriors, you can connect with Kadena Cox on all of the channels mentioned. Facey B, I love that because I've not heard it called that before. <laughs> <laughs> and Insta, of course, go and find Kadena on Insta. And I will uh, add all of those links into the description in, in the top so go and click on those and remember warriors stay enabled so thanks so much Kadina I'll chat to you again soon yeah. Yeah. stay enabled if you want to fight back against your invisible illness and help take the dis out of disability then join the tribe on facebook facebook.com slash enabled warriors if you love this podcast click that subscribe button and never miss another episode and remember, warriors, stay enabled.